Welcome everybody to our today's webinar called the Data Exchange with Argos and Symphony, Supply Portals in the Automotive Sector. My name is uh, Ralf Klimke. I'm responsible for sales and marketing at Argosense. And uh, with me in the meeting, we have Christian Middle, who will take over uh, the technical part of uh, today's webinar and give you a live <clears throat> demonstration uh, of our product uh, in combination with uh, the supplier portal here uh, from BMW. Um, before we before we start uh, going directly into the topic, here's a brief agenda for, for today. So um, I will share some words about Argosense, followed by the, uh, let's say, more general um, uh, topic of error management in the automotive industry and what the challenges and uh, possible options are here. And then we will go directly into the live demonstration and after that, we'll have a question and answer session, Christian. So we are specialized in tool integration and data exchange already since 2009, where we started our, uh, our company and our first projects and our product. Uh, in 2013, we um, added an, an additional solution for traceability and requirements management. Uh, as out of uh, all the projects we have done so far in tool integration, we have seen that there is a potential market also for a requirements management system. Uh, we have heard a lot of complaints from our customers uh, regarding the stuff they are using. And so we thought uh, maybe that's also a good point here to have a second product. Uh, here in this space, but this is nothing we, we want to talk about today. Um, very important is uh, our consultants and our, our software developers and our support team, they have all expertise with all the leading ALM tools or so everything that needs to be integrated with each other or needs to exchange data um, with external parties. We are <clears throat> very, very familiar with, and I think that helps in in a result of very short uh, implementation times, uh, which really will be uh, or is a big benefit for our customers. Um, in the meantime, I think we have a quite strong representation in the automotive industry. You will see that on one of the next slides um, that we have some, some very interesting brands here uh, that we can call our customers. And um, yeah, thanks to them, uh, the product is where it is right now because we, uh, believe that it's very important to align product development really focused on uh, focused on the market demands and, and what our customers are demanding. So this is basically, I would say, 80% at least of what uh, goes into the product and uh, the future development um, is, is all about uh, the stuff our customers are, are requiring here. Um, here, um, as I promised, uh, a subset of, uh, of our customers and uh, if there is somebody in the audience who wants to talk to one of one of our existing customers and get a first hand information about our product and our company um, don't hesitate to ask us and we will try to connect you with somebody um, out directly of your of your industry so what are our solutions of course um, the, our main solution, as I already indicated, is uh, for ALM tool integration and B2B data exchange called Argus and Symphony. And the second product uh, I just mentioned is uh, called Argus and Fidelia for change controlled requirements management. Um, this also is can be used for, let's say, kind of get a little bit more visibility of what is uh, going on um, in tool integration, so we can also use that for traceability across different tools on, on, a, on a top layer, so to say. So as you see, Argus and Symphony has, has two main aspects. One is ALM tool integration. The other one is the automated B2B data exchange, where we want to focus today. And um, as you can see here on that little picture, um, Argus and Symphony is more or less structured kind of like a bus system so where we can connect all the different tools now in, in, in our example here today for data exchange we are mainly focusing on, uh, on change defect management products here of course um, which then uh, will be directly integrated um, with 
the exchange platforms or the supplier portals, which are provided by by our, uh, our OEM friends here, uh, so to say, so that we can <clears throat> completely, let's say, um, integrate the, uh, the development cycle of your customers with uh, with your internal development cycle. So that's that's the goal here. Um, we are currently have out of the box um, solutions for BMW, for Mercedes-Benz, Daimler, for Porsche, for Volkswagen, Audi. Um, they have all different kind of portals, which have a complete different technical uh, basis on that. But uh, with our adaptive technology, which we want to talk later about, um, it's very easy to to connect to these systems and uh, in a relatively short time uh, establish and completely automated data transfer in both directions. So this is always the goal, of course. But looking first a little bit more general on that on that topic. So so what is this uh, use case data exchange or in, in especially error management in the automotive industry? What is this about? Um, the situation is, I think, for most of you, very clear development cycles, they decrease um, uh, each uh, each time, of course, quality and same time quality and security requirements, um, they increase. So um, this is, I would say, the, uh, the, the most important uh, two topics uh, that you are confronted with. And therefore, a very strong integration between OEMs and um, suppliers is, is necessary because the communication efforts between the parties, they are very, very demanding um, with regards to um, error report, reporting and fixing of these ones. And on top of that, uh, usually the OEMs, they have, as I said, supplier portals, um, they provide for their, for their suppliers and they make them mandatory to be used. They have different ways. They have um, some, some you can reach <clears throat> additional via, via a web interface where you can then edit and, um, and, and retrieve data, so to say, by hand um, as a separate application. Or they offer, and I think all of them, of course, offer a kind of a batch access possibility via an API. So that that's the point where we can connect to and uh, make everything as automated as possible here. From that technical technical connection perspective, uh, is, this looks basically from a very high level like that. So we have the two parties and uh, after some negotiations, of course, OEM places an order to the supplier, maybe here for a control device. Um, the supplier begins to develop that one, um, doing his internal testing, of course, before he delivers anything um, to, to the OEM. Um, collecting all the upcoming uh, bugs uh, in, in, in his own defect management system. And at a certain point of time, a sample will be delivered to the OEM, where then the OEM internally tests, uh, maybe integration tests or unit tests or whatever. And of course, they have their, again, their own change defect management, and they will provide the data they they collect here and the, the, the errors and the bugs they find, um, they will provide that in their portal uh, where it can be, or well, this data can be retrieved via XML files or maybe direct uh, REST API access. So now the question is, how does the data go back and forth between supplier and, and OEM? So that means from the technical connection, again, the OEM determines that one. So they offer and they make mandatory the supplier portal. For example, at Daimler, it's, um, in the meantime, it's Dante and also the new one Star. BMW has one called Kaesi, Porsche has one, Volkswagen, Audi, and so on and so on. So some of uh, the OEMs, they may have a direct access to, to tools like Jira, uh, but anyway, you need, you need to connect to these tools. Other ones, they have additional layers like um, the OFTP file transfer, or maybe they are using an ASAM kind of file format. For example, Porsche um, uses ASAM files uh, to exchange. They do not have a direct REST API. So that's all, I would say, additional complexity layers uh, to the whole topic. 
And from the process perspective, um, also the OEM determines workflow rules or data synchronization itself, attribute, attribute mappings. That is uh, of course also determined by, by your customers. And uh, the supplier has somehow to um, align this process and technical requirements within within his uh, internal change or defect management solution and organization of course and can look like that so this is from this is from uh, from a customer project uh, just as a as an overview so what you see here is simply that uh, that uh, um, on the, on the top side the supplier has its own internal workflow and the oem has its own workflow and at some certain point in time, in time uh, they require a state transition or a, let's say an information transition at a certain state and this is what you what you can see here so this is just one simple example for kind of a new defect but there may be <clears throat> additional processes maybe for duplicate defects or if the supplier um, uh, um, reports a defect directly to the OEM before he himself detects it, whatever. So there are different use cases which all should be taken into consideration in um, implementing such a, such a data exchange. From the requirements perspective, so it means what are the requirements to such a solution on the process, on the process side here, um, here, of course, the coordination uh, between OEM and supplier internal workflows. So like we have seen state transition models, for example, um, but also an agreement and alignment for data, which data should be exchanged and how should, um, should it be mapped between the different tools um, customer and suppliers are using. Then, of course, the configuration of the data sync itself. So, how often should be the interval um, or the reaction time? Is there is there a certain um, due date required or whatever? So, all that um, that these these kind of rules they need to be considered and also implemented into the solution. From the technical perspective, again, um, what we see here is um, we need an adaptation to adapt adaptation to the portal specific either XML format or the API, which is uh, given by the, by the OEM. And um, the most important goal then, of course, is that we can synchronize everything without any manual interaction at the, uh, at the end. And that means also to um, achieve that, that we need a compatibility with any kind of internal tracking or change management tool uh, on the supplier side. So this is very important. Maybe you want to change it in over time, or maybe you have different ones internally in use, but you different departments and they are but all serving the same customers. So this is also very um, important requirements towards such a solution here. And last but not least, um, as most of the suppliers do not have only one customer and not only one project per customer and maybe the exchange intervals are very <clears throat> very short of course the solution has to scale also on the one hand side for high data volumes but also to a large volume of exchange intervals here and uh, yeah what you can see from there they are very I would say not lightweight requirements to such a solution in order to make it really reliable um, uh, in, in terms of uh, operations. So what are the alternatives? Um, the simplest one would be to just use the web interface provided by the, by the OEM in its supplier portal. So where you manually submit um, your defects, but this of course does not really make sense because you have to create the data two times, you have to maintain it uh, two times. Um, it's very error prone if, if a person has to do that here. So usually I would say this is not really in use even if such web interfaces are um, offered. The other alternative that we see or what customers consider is that they completely program such kind of a solution by themselves. But in the end, um, and a lot of them after some years or months were coming to us using or uh, asking for something, yeah, let's say more professional or um, really available on the market as a product because self-programmed software is 
always very high effort and extensive in maintenance, especially if uh, more and more product uh, projects will, will come up in future. And uh, very often there's a complete new development necessary if you want to um, to integrate new or another OEM with another project here. So it's it's also the maintenance and everything is um, really really high high effort here. So, but with solutions like Argus and Symphony, where you can get more or less everything um, out of the box, um, plus some customization, um, everything at the end will be completely automated um, with the customization options. It will be flexible and extensible. Um, out of the box process templates are, are offered. So that means that we can really um, make the implementation times as short as possible. Um, of course, some testing is always necessary, but um, but I think it's it's really key to have something already existing here, which, which you can use in first place. And of course, if um, additional uh, projects uh, come up so that it's really just point and click and um, maybe make some additional attribute mapping and then the projects can run. So there's nothing that you have to code or, or program here. And um, last but not least here, uh, as I said at the beginning, you can also use, of course, uh, Symfony also for internal tool integration, so which makes it more or less a one for all solution here in, uh, in most of our customers' environments. So before I hand over to, to Christian, let's just have a look on a very high level on the technical architecture of uh, Argus and Symphony. And just a reminder, if you have any questions, uh, just type them in so that you do not forget anything at the end um, if some, something arises here. Um, again, here you can see um, the, uh, the, the architecture that it's uh, implemented as a bus system where the different uh, tools are connected to via adapters and the adapters they usually just have to have the task to um, let's say translate um, the api um, syntax and the data format into our platform so that internally we can make use of that translated and normalized data and send it back and forth uh, between the different systems in a in a very consistent way here Additionally, we have some, we call that modules. This is the, the, the web-based uh, web administration. So there's a browser-based um, um, administration um, uh, GUI here available for, for the admins. So where you can put in all the, the mapping, the attribute mappings, you can put in the, schedule, the schedules for the intervals where data should be synchronized. All that we will see in the live demo here. Um, what is also very important that uh, with different customers or maybe also with different projects, you may have some kind of slightly different uh, integration scenarios, maybe different mappings, uh, maybe different schedules. Of course, this can be also um, really uh, configured individually for each of your products completely um, independent from each other. So we have an unlimited number of uh, integration scenarios that we can support. And as I already said, um, that we are also supporting and deliver um, so kind of synchronization or process templates for really quick uh, implementation. And for those uh, more sophisticated users, um, we have we are opening our adapter framework, uh, which gives our customers and partners the option to develop own specific custom adapters, um, but using our technology here. So this is very interesting for customers which already, already are using Symfony and they do not want to have a different technology for integrating maybe any self-developed tool or something which maybe we do not have a commercial uh, adapter for. Um, so this is something where, as I said, is one for all solution is really here the key word so that customers really can rely on our on our system, even if they uh, want to integrate something we cannot help them with. So from uh, going back to that to that picture here, um, so we did end at the question, how does the data now 
goes back and forth. And uh, in best case, Symfony is installed on the supplier side. Um, we will in install also the respective port adapter. For example, at Mercedes Benz, it would be the Stark or the Dante adapter here, uh, so that we are able to retrieve the data which is uh, Daimler, um, which, which Daimler is providing here. And Symfony then is um, through its bus and process framework, then translating the data through the respective tool adapter, for example, Jira, RTC, Integrity, whatever, and puts the data automatically directly into the supplier internal tool here. So this goes, of course, in both directions. And uh, what we have to do is, of course, install the synchronization template, or maybe make some configuration and some, some um, customization for that, depending on, on the requirements for the project, of course. So this is the, the most easy way. So one, one customer, one project, but of course it's a little bit more complex. So customers do not have only, or suppliers do not have only one customer. Um, they may have, of course, different customers. And with these different customers, they will for sure not only have one project, they will have multiple projects. And each and every of these projects has to be has to be configured somehow. Um, in Symfony, it's very easy with the graphical interface and with the reuse approach we have here. And now I think you can already imagine what this would mean if you develop something like that on your own. Uh, even if you then consider that the complexity goes even further, if you want to integrate maybe also suppliers, sub suppliers on the supplier side. So this, of course, is also possible. Now, with the, with the platform. So in essence, um, as a very short summary before I now really hand over to Christian, um, what we are supporting um, with Symfony, on the one hand side, we are supporting out of the box the different OEM portals and also different formats which are used maybe within these portals, like is an issue, also Excel, for example, as a file format is used. And we are supporting the different tools you have uh, in-house and um, you need to in and export uh, your data with. Okay, so then let's see if uh, Kristen is ready. So give me just a second to hand over my screen to him, just a second. So this should work now. Yes. Thanks, Ralph. Um, so, uh, yeah. So, um, I am just right now in the middle of, of a synchronization with the BMW. Uh, what we can uh, see here is the is the Symphony administration interface. Um, and I had a couple of like this is the BMW's development environment. So on a regular basis, we receive automatically created um, defects for testing purposes. So um, I ran this um, while while Ralph was talking. Um, what we see is Symphony's uh, diagnose screen, so which helps us understand what's going on right now in the platform. So uh, this is actually the synchronization of the demonstration project. Um, I will take you uh, first uh, through what we call the configuration module. And that configuration module uh, provides a, a, a good overview of, of all the components that are installed. So on the one hand side, I have installed the TIEZ adapter. This is um, the connector to BMW's interface. Um, we also have installed the Jira adapter. Um, and uh, I'm running a local local Jira here for testing purposes. Um, we have installed the basic uh, process template. This is kind of the best practice um, collection that we that we created during the last ten years. Um, it's a um, it's a toolkit of of certain behaviors for the synchronizations that we can just. Is that we can just plug and play in order to get get the things running, and then we have the um, the TZ to to Jira process installed. <clears throat> That's then kind of the glue um, that tells us really how the synchronization goes goes forward. 
Um, on the adapter side, um, if I double click the adapter, I'll get into its its configurations, its configuration sets, how we call it. This is pretty much like an alias for any connection that I can build. So in that case, I I, I called the configuration BMW Dev. Uh, double click it again, so we see a couple of um, connection parameters. These are all used in order to set up the, the session with uh, BMW. Um, so in this case, that's going to bring us um, together with the with the development environment. And I could then have also multiple other sets, like for example, the next one would be with the integration environment and so on, and finally with the production environment. Um, for all the adapters, you can have as many uh, config sets as you need. It means you can have as many server connections as you want. Um, and uh, what we do is around the server connections, uh, <clears throat> there's also a mechanism in, in Symfony that is on a regular basis checking the connection. It's what we call the pinging, um, so that we get a get a good overview on of, of which which connections are working and which are not. Um, through these connections, we do also um, expose the data models of the tools, like go back to BMW and check what attributes do they have. So um, that later on, um, you can easily uh, manage the transformation of the data. The same happens for Jira. So it's my local Jira. I'm just here connect to local host, same story. Um, Safe and ping. As you see, some of the uh, configuration options, some of the connection parameters are different between the tools. Um, that is due to the fact that the APIs are organized a little bit uh, differently. Mostly, you've got to find an address and some uh, credentials. So, I've been setting up uh, the, the development environment for BMW, my local Jira. Um, the process template itself is just a collection of best practices, doesn't need any, doesn't require any setup. And then finally, um, the process itself between TZ and Jira just requires a couple of basic, uh, basic settings. So, I prepared that as well as my demo project. So what we need to tell Symfony is which connection to Jira is um, are we using, which connection to TZ we are using. Then we have to tell which project uh, in Jira we want to use if there's new defects coming from BMW. Um, we need to know what issue type should be created in Jira if there's a new defect from BMW. And then uh, we have um, basically a couple of different what we call mapping scenarios. And these are translations um, that need to be set up um, for certain cases of the synchronization. So for example, scenario new BS1 is uh, the case in which BMW has raised a new ticket, presents it in TZ, and we have to make sure there's a new, um, a new JIRA ticket created for that. So for simplicity, I was just using um, all the same mappings, but you can have different mapping scenarios. So we can jump into the mapping module itself from here, just so that you get an impression. So these mapping scenarios are organized in different types. It's kind of a folder structure to better organize. Um, some of our, our larger customers, they do have more than 60, 60, 70 projects being synchronized. So you can imagine, and if you if you run a couple of, of mod, more of those synchronizations, and these types do really help to, to get things organized a bit. So here it's pretty simple. We just have the demonstration case and that one scenario. Um, so in the scenario itself, this is just what we call the attribute mapping. That's just a list of, um, of transformation rules. So if I get into this, I could just click here. So that's all the attributes coming from the MW side. I don't know what what we need is maybe the problem severity wants to go into and then we have maybe a priority here so uh, this is this is how you can how you can then basically easily set up um, for certain cases um, there is uh, there is attributes that we call enumeration attributes so um, the values behind is not 
it's not can not freely be chosen, but as a as a real list behind it, um, we do have what we call a, a value mapping also in symphonies. I can just get in here and I make sure um, these are now these are the selections like okay, this is what BMW is going to send us safety relevant. This is going to be in uh, in Jira. Now it's going to load stuff for the Jira. Oh, hopefully my Jira is not crashed. At this time, I can do then uh, a selection of the of the appropriate value in uh, in the Jira side, and this way I can then just simply set up the. Um, so I can just simply set up all the all the mappings as I need them. Um, so that's what we call the value mappings. Um, and these are basically then all organized under the under the um, scenario itself, configured here. Um, and then I would have a, a per project configuration of the of the synchronization. Um, the last step that is required in Symphony is then what we call the scheduling. It's pretty similar to what we saw for the mappings uh, for the mappings. So it's organized in schedule groups. So I would have in a Scenario I would have like the BMW side ones, BMW scenarios, uh, schedules, and so on. And then inside uh, each schedule group, I do have a schedule table, and that schedule table uses um, basically um, basically a cron type of definition. Uh, it's super flexible, and we put a, a little editor that helps you filling in um, filling in all the aspects of it, like whenever it should be launched. There's also a little translation into your own readable format. So I've set it up so that it fires every day at 10.15. Um, and then basically what I did is not wait for 10.15, but I just ran it manually. And that usually then brings you into the diagnose module that we already saw. So where Symphony is is going to just let us know um, know what's going on. So as you can see, there's now some there's now some crash, I guess, with either the BMW side or the Jira side. Um, so I, in that case, what I can do is I can just um, I can just let me just for a second stop the transaction itself. Um, the transaction mechanism in Symphony is built in such a way that it does a scoping uh, in the beginning. So that means it's going to identify um, all the objects that need to be synchronized. Um, in this case, on the BMW side, then builds a list of tasks and then walks through through each of the tasks and executes them um, as we need it. Um, and so at any point in time we can of course stop the transaction we could also have paused it um, to look up uh, what's going on and if i restart the transaction it's going to just start from the failed ones not it's not going after all the succeeding succeeding ones um, so it's kind of an optimization that that we do have here um, and then for most of the yeah, we can also hear from the. Um, ah, look, I was I crashed it. I crashed it, but it's just changing the mappings on the line. So I was just selecting invalid priorities. That makes it crash. So there's a there's also a reporting module. It's kind of like a log file, um, which is telling us um, the truth and the details behind what's going on. If there's a if there's a trouble, um, that's. Pretty much most of um, most of what uh, what needs to be done in the platform itself in order to get uh, to get things moving um, was pretty much everything that I wanted to show you as a first first impression. Um, and I would then just hand back to Ralph. Um, Yeah, thank you, Christian. So um, just take back the screen. Okay, so I hope you got a, a good impression um, in that in that little demonstration regarding regarding symphony. Of course, if there is 
um, for you more interest here in our product and you would like to have a little bit more deep dive into the system and uh, maybe uh, proof concept installation or whatever, just um, just talk to us and then we will arrange everything, of course. Um, before we are going over to the uh, Q&A session, there's uh, still enough time to, to raise your questions. Um, I would just talk uh, about a few additional features we have not talked about. Uh, so one, as I said, um, the system should be scalable, of course. Uh, what we see uh, is, is a very important requirement and Symfony has implemented uh, an option for clustering and horizontal load balancing. That means uh, we simply install second, the third, or fourth Symfony server and uh, with a uh, little configuration um, i think it's it's one line in a config file they can then all talk to each other and every cluster node exactly knows what the other clusters are working on in case one is failing the other ones are taking over all the tasks without any loss um, and at the same time that gives you um, not only the ability for a fail safe operation of course uh, the clusters they will balance the load uh, between each other so that one cluster is really at its limits, uh, the next task will be taken automatically by the second or the third cluster node here. And um, the last slide regarding features here is uh, what we are also supporting, just to let you know that it's contextual information and attachment. That means, of course, we can also transfer hierarchies and structures, information of elements like parent child relationships or stuff like that. Of course, we can um, synchronize file attachments, uh, common type fields, rich text will also be considered uh, if supported by, by the tools uh, which are in use. And of course, from the load and process perspective, um, the system um, is, as we have seen, um, time, uh, time controlled um, on the one hand side starts the synchronization based on the schedule, but we can also change that into, into, a, a, into a world where, for example, based on an event uh, that is happening in one of the tools, maybe a new item is, uh, is uh, created in a certain project and the system supports such kind of event triggers. We can use, for example, that event to start a synchronization directly where we do not have to wait for for an interval time coming up. So there are different different ways also. And um, as, as the, the topic is already indicating that we are um, synchronizing multiple um, tasks at the same time. We call it parallel processing. Of course, that's also possible. So not only one project with one customer can be synchronized at the same time. So it could be more than one, of course, parallel. And uh, last but not least, very important also um, for repeating um, data synchronization, of course, it's very important that we do not synchronize data again and again, which already has been synchronized, but did not change in the, in the time in between. So we are also recording um, some information about the data we are trans transferring and, um, and um, we are then Based on that, just synchronize that data, which is uh, which is has not been touched before um, after the last uh, after the last run, or has been touched, so to say. And on the other hand side, so we also are storing the, the the pairs of the items. So on the OEM side, uh, your item has a certain ID, and on your internal side, the item has a certain ID. And these key pairs, of course, they must be matched in order to link this two different uh, data records. And this is something we can store also in our database, which not has to be done uh, in, your, in your tools database, for example. Okay, so now I think we are quite at the end of, of today's webinar. So I will just let flow one, one more slide here without any, without any comment from my side. Again, um, I would encourage you to to raise your questions if you have any. Um, otherwise, um, I would like to thank you, first of all, for your, for your interest and for the time, and also would like to um, 
I'll give you a small hint for another webinar, which we have planned for Friday, July 10 at 11 in the morning. Um, so there we will talk about the integration um, and the data exchange with the Mercedes-Benz um, Start tool and Start portal, where we have newly created an adapter. And there are some updates for um, which are, I think, very interesting for customers which are already using that system, but also for those ones who are still thinking about um, going into, into that direction. I'm just going back to two slides and I see there's uh, one question coming up. So let me see here. Um, there's one question uh, regarding the certification of uh, VDA or TSACs. So we do not have an official certification for that product. We have, um, I think we have a certain degree of validation. So we have, for one of our customers, we already have uh, filled out that large Excel sheet with a self-assessment. And I think that was looking very promising and was um, kindly accepted by, by our customer here. Uh, so that it's sufficient for them. I'm not sure if there is really a a certification for a product um, possible uh, for the VDA. Because um, I think this is this uh, TSAX um, stuff is more related to the security processes you have implemented within your company. I think that's not really related to a product directly. So if we do not have any any more questions? I'll jump back to the last slide again. Again, here um, with the hint for the next webinar. So, then again, I would like to thank you all in the name of Christian and uh, the whole team of Argosense. Thank you for your time, and hope to see you maybe on July 10th or in any other webinar we are we are organizing in future. So. Stay healthy and thanks again and uh, have a good uh, rest of the week. Bye-bye.